Okay, and Lori uh, Gradner is on here, so she's going to kind of help manage me as we as we move along. All right, so the good, the bad, and the ugly of the insect world, and you know what? Why do we even talk about insects? You know, why are they so troublesome? And actually, they're they're from an ancient lineage of arthropods, and this is one of those cool things that we're going to talk about during uh, the September twenty first class. But uh, we're going to talk a little bit about trilobites and where some of the larger populations of those are. But trilobites are extinct, but these arthropods are not. So that's just kind of setting some background for tonight. And we know all of these uh, species existed because we can see their fossils in that sedimentary rock um, that was once in the shorelines of those um, ancient seas, inland seas. And one of those, um, again, is like close to uh, Burlington, Vermont, in the Lake Champlain um, area, and extends all the way down into the Cumberland Gap here in Tennessee. Uh, just to give you an FYI, there's been over a million insects that have been identified. That's a lot of bugs. That's why we're not going to be able to cover everything tonight. Uh, but this gives you a little picture of how we break down insects to just give you a better understanding of where these fall out. We have vertebrates and we have invertebrates. So vertebrates is where we as humans are going to fall along with birds and fish, reptiles, and amphibians. But for tonight we're going to be talking about invertebrates and you can see all those listed there which are going to include worms and mollusks and then everything within uh, the arthropods. So there's actually six, cl six classes and I'm not going to bog you down with all of this information because it is a lot. But for all intents and purposes, we're going to talk about those bottom two, which is the arachnid and the insects, which is going to include spiders, mites, and insects. But just to kind of give you an idea of some of those other classes, uh, the crustaceans, that's going to be anything, lobster, shrimp, crabs. But it's also really cool because pill bugs, or what some of you may refer to as roly polies, they kind of look prehistoric. Um, they actually fall into to a crustacean category, but we treat them often like insects in, um, in homes and, and garden settings. Then we have the symphala class, and this is where all of your centipedes and millipedes are going to fall into. Um, if any of you are avid hikers, you've probably seen this critter. Um, there's nothing on the screen now. No. There's not? No. You haven't been sharing screen. I've not been? Nope. Oh, well, I'm glad you interrupted me. Okay. Yeah, I just sent you a text, Melody, to tell you that. Oh, well, I'm on silent. No wonder. I think I'm sharing it backwards. Y'all can't see it. Okay, now, what do you see? We can see you. You can see me. Okay, we're now, getting now we got closer. It. Now we got it. You're good. But now I can't see the screen. This is I not good. I have a whole bunch of women. <laughs> there you go. The good, the bad, the ugly. Okay, is it just the slide or do you see notes? Slide. Just the slide. Just the slide. Okay. All right. Well, I showed you all these great fossils that you didn't get to see, so I'll just zip <laughs> right through those real quick. And here's that uh, schematic I was talking about with the vertebrates and the invertebrates. Lord, I could never remember all that out of my head, y'all. Okay. Thanks for interrupting there. Sorry, guys. Okay, there we go. Crustaceans. Um, this is where the pill bug falls into, the roly-poly. All right, the symphala class, um, just basic garden uh, millipedes and centipedes. And then this was the one I was talking about. Um, if you pick this critter up and shake him, he'll um, exude a fragrance, either like a raspberry flavor or some are like an almond fragrance. So if you're ever hiking in the woods and see him, just pick one up. It won't hurt them. Just shake them and it's kind of cool. All right, arachnids, that's um, everything from ticks and spiders, scorpions and mites. And the reason that I put this in here, there is a little bit of a distinction. When we talk about insects, we'll often throw mites into that same category, but we're gonna use a little bit different control strategy for mites versus insects. And if we're using some insecticides, they can actually increase our populations of certain species of mites. So that's one thing to kind of log in the back of your mind. I uh, just put a picture in here of some of the more common insects that we that we see. And this is also in the Google Drive, so you can refer back to that. 
Uh, just some pictures of our favorite, the Japanese beetle, which wreaked a lot of havoc uh, just a couple months ago, or a couple weeks ago, rather. But we're getting into the insect class here. Um, I'm not going to, again, bog you down into the insect morphology and, and things like that. I share this with you simply to let you know that when you do bring an insect in for identification in the extension office, uh, master gardener lab, whatever, our, our plant lab in Nashville, they're going to utilize some of this morphology and hopefully some of this you'll kind of pick up on because we want to be treating insects at the proper life stage to be able to get better control. And again, this is something we're going to speak a little bit more to as we move through this evening. Uh, this is some of the insect orders, again, not to bog you down, but to let you know when we do talk about different um, plant varieties and things like that, we always say use the Latin or use the botanic name. Kind of the same here with insects. Um, just an FYI, anything that ends in that uh, P-T-E-R-A, that means it has wings. And anything that has the A-P-T-E-R-A means that they have no wings. So that's one way we can distinguish between those two orders. So basically Hymenoptera, they're going to have wings. Again, just some background here. Um, there's over 300,000 species of beetles, 120,000 flies, 108,000 wasps, bees, and ants, which we need for pollinators, 112,000 species of butterflies and moths, and then we have about 50,000 species of true bugs. And then 32,000 aphids or scale insects. And that's going to be, um, even though it's a smaller population, this one is where a lot of our trouble is going to come from in our home gardens and our landscape. So that's why it's so critical. And just to kind of give you an idea about the beetle species, because even when you bring them in here for identification, oftentimes we'll just say, that's a beetle. We don't maybe always get real in-depth with the species, um, unless you're my good friend Seth that's an agent in Anderson County because he's trained in entomology, so he's going to know a lot of those different species. But basically one in five living animal species on the planet is a beetle, so that just kind of tells you how many beetles that we do have. Uh, we're going to spend the next few minutes just talking about how insects grow and develop because this is going to be critical for you to know these two differences, again just to be able to know when the best time to treat for specific pests are going to be. So some um, insects are going to reproduce by complete metamorphosis. This goes back to elementary school. It's, it's basically going from one form to another. So we're going to start with that egg. Um, we go into that larva, so like a caterpillar, go to the pupa stage, and then we emerge as a butterfly or a moth. The incomplete or the gradual metamorphosis, basically they start out once they hatch from an egg just to a teeny tiny version of their adult self. So some of you may have seen some of these um, praying mantis, it's not listed here, um, but that's one of the cool, you know, when they emerge from their cocoon, there are just thousands of those little bitty praying mantises, um, but they basically just look the same all through their life cycles, through their molts. And this is where all of our true bugs are going to be, which is going to be a lot of our garden insects. Um, aphids are unique again, they're going to be the smallest population of insects, but they're going to be able to give live birth or they're going to be able to lay eggs. And this is your word for, for tonight, it's called parthenogenesis. And basically what that is, is just the growth of that embryo occurring without any kind of fertilization. So when we talk about that in relation to plants, just think about it as a bud that's developing um, and it's, it's developing opposed to germinating basically externally. Uh, from a seed. So think about hens and chicks. If anybody has those with those airplane plants, that's kind of what that's similar to. I hope that provides a, an analogy there. So why do we care about bugs? Well, I'm, I'm going to start out maybe backwards. Uh, most people say because they eat everything in my garden, which they do. But uh, some bugs are going to be very beneficial. And we talked about that a couple months ago when we, when we spent an hour on just beneficial bugs and how to draw those populations in. So if you missed that class, you can go back and, and watch that just specific to the beneficials. But uh, they're going to be beneficial because they're going to provide pollination. Uh, they're going to help with decomposition and soil aeration, which is what we're going to talk about in a couple weeks when we do uh, some soil science concepts. Um, also for some medical uses, I think bee venom has been used for, for maybe some arthritis medications and things. I'm not a doctor, so I'm not going to speak to that, but I know there, there are some uses for that. Um, they're going to pro provide an aesthetic value. You know, sometimes we forget that 
um, butterflies are actually falling into this insect category. Um, and I know all of our master gardener projects here in the county, were, they're all a monarch way station, as well as several of the master gardeners themselves and their personal uh, landscapes and property are monarch way stations. So a lot of folks will do this just to do landscapes just to draw in the butter, butterfly pollination or populations. Uh, the big one, though, is when they're going to uh, cause harm or injury to our gardens, landscape, um, and our forested areas. And we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about that tonight. They're going to um, promote feeding damage. They can be in our stored foods. Uh, of course, termites can eat wood. Uh, they can get in our fabrics. And then they can vector diseases and to plants and animals. Think about our ticks. Um, this is just going to show you ways that insects actually do enter the plant. And this again is going to be real critical. So when you do go back to that um, Google Drive, make sure to, to kind of refer to this because again, this is going to help you be able to control a pest a little bit easier. And I'm going to show you examples of that in the next few slides. So um, as we move through these next few slides, don't really focus on the insect per se, focus on the damage because I want to preface this section by saying uh, oftentimes when we get um, specimens brought into the office or submitted, you know, by a picture, a lot of folks will, will think it's um, an insect pest and it, it could be a physiological factor with the weather. Uh, it could be something related to pH um, or it could be disease. Um, but sometimes we're going to have real insect damage and people don't realize it's insect damage. You know, they it's, it's really a disease or an insect that's causing a disease. So that's why it's so critical to make sure that we identify whatever issue that we have going on, because otherwise, if we're, if we're uh, spraying our tomatoes for tomato spotted wilt virus, that's a virus, but that's vectored by an insect, right? But if we're spraying it for a disease, rather than that insect, then we're not gonna get any control. So that's just another reason it's gonna be real critical to know um, what these pests are. But they're going to affect uh, different plants different ways. And you saw how many insects there are, so lots of mechanisms there. But when we think about chewing insects, you can see what the damage is going to look like there. They can have a very voracious appetite. Some of these can. Uh, but beetles can cause this kind of damage, as well as caterpillars. When we look at sucking insects, you'll often see this spittling on the leaf. Uh, some folks will think that this is disease because it looks like a water soaked spot. This will almost look like a physiological type issue with something going on in the soil. But in reality, that's just some species of true bugs, which is where stink bugs are going to fall or scale insects are causing an issue. So again, don't get too hung up on the insect, but just look at some of this damage and kind of make mental note if you've seen some of these happening. Internal feeders, some of these can actually. Um, leave a pretty cool little roadmap for you. Those are probably going to be one of the easiest to identify. But you can see what the inside of that tree looks like. That's borer damage. And many different types of borers, and they're going to cause damage um, early on that we might not often see until too late to be able to do anything about it. And then you can see what leaf miners are going to do. They just lay their eggs and they leave little paths through the leaf. And again, on some of these internal feeders, um, a lot of folks will bring maple leaves in thinking this is a disease, some type of fungus. Um, in reality, that is an aryphid mite. And then we also have the gall wasp that will lay um, these insect clusters. And I'm going to show you better pictures of these in a few minutes. As far as subterranean, of course, that means anything below that soil line. Uh, we can get significant root injury from grub feeding. Um, we all know grub worms are going to be June bugs, Japanese beetles, uh, May beetles, but there's going to be a specific time to control these. Um, I've actually put a, a publication in your Google Drive just specific to Japanese beetles. Um, the seed injury can be caused by wire worms. We don't see a lot of these in East Tennessee, but you can see what it's doing there um, as far as germination. And, and when that happens, then you're not going to get good seed germination. Jim, I hope you don't have wire worms. I wouldn't think so. I've, I've not seen many of those here in Greene County. But. Um, this is injury caused by egg laying. And you can see the, the wound here on this branch. 
and cicadas are really bad to incur this damage and we all know what time of year it is i forgot what generation we're in uh, but they'll wound that tree limb and can then that what that's going to do is promote uh, pathogens disease pathogens to come in and be a secondary or even a tertiary um, issue with that plant so that's why it's real critical when we are scouting uh, the garden and the landscape to make sure that we're that we're looking at these type things and you can see a little bit better picture there you can see that cicada how she's moving along laying those eggs and, and slicing through that wood um, again, chewing insects, um, I've showed you a few pic pictures of that already. Um, if you have twigs like this that are just lying on the ground and you've not had any storms like we've had here lately, um, that could be a, a signal, you know, that you've got some kind of um, ambrosia beetle boring through and laying its larva. Um, hackberries, elms, hickories, any of those nut trees are going to be really prevalent. To some of these issues. Um, again, I've already kind of alluded to this one, but um, we've got those insects that are going to vector diseases like aphids or thrips. Vector, um, this should be thrips, not aphids, y'all. Sorry. So if you have this presentation, mark that out because it is thrips. But it's going to vector tomato spotted wilt virus. But we have lots of others, um, insects that are going to vector other diseases. Um, some of you probably have fallen victim to this this year. Um, cucumber beetles can vector bacterial wilt. And then some of these are actually even going to almost resemble um, herbicide injury. So again, the, the main purpose of some of these is to show you that insects are going to cause a lot more issues than just holes in the leaves. Or, you know, we might not always see those egg casings on the underside of, of the leaves in our garden. Um, we're, they're going to show us a lot of different ways that they're going to be present. So that was kind of the whole basis behind those first few slides is just to, to give you an idea of some of that different um, different mechanisms that they're going to do this because again it's going to be critical to know what we're dealing with to be able to treat it best. And some of you may have rose bushes and we know that uh, this has been a major issue um, in the past. And it just left me what it's called, and I don't have that in my notes, the uh, aryphid um, mite. And they're so tiny, I mean, you can't hardly see those. And see the injury here? I mean, we're getting into late summer, so this is something that we're all going to see, um, especially throughout the south. But we got to pay really careful attention because if it's certain species of trees, uh, then we're going to know that there might be a leafhopper at work. And you can see this oak tree. Some of us may just be inclined to think, well, that's just dry heat damage. Uh, but in reality, this is a leafhopper that is vectoring this disease. And you can see there what that entire tree is going to look like. And once we get to that point, it's a bacterial disease. So we all know, especially on a tree this size, it's either going to cost us a fortune or we're not going to be able to, to really save that tree. But if we can find these little critters early, uh, we might be able to, to garner some control. Okay, some um, of these that vector disease are going to spread fungal diseases, which probably is going to be the easiest to control. Um, but some of you may have heard of the elm bark beetle that uh, pretty much decimated elm trees several years ago. Um, this was probably my favorite tree at my grandparents' house. And... I mean, it just didn't stand a chance once the elm bark beetle got control of it. But, you know, at that time, it was su such an early occurrence that you didn't, we didn't know what that was. It wasn't until, you know, several years later that we knew that it was this pest causing the issue. And I've already showed you some pictures there, bacterial leaf scorch, but again, just to have that to refer back to. Just an FYI, we talk about how great bees are, and they are. We don't want to be harming those populations at all, but they can. Uh, vector disease. Fire blight that we see oftentimes on our fruit trees um, actually can be spread through bees. They're not they're not meaning no harm, it's just accidental as they're flying around buzzing and, and pollinating. So just be aware of that. Now what we're going to do is just talk a little bit about some specific garden insects and I put all this verbiage up on slides just so when I printed this in a PDF you would have it 
uh, for ease of mind. So don't worry, I'm not going to read all these slides to you because uh, you'll have that. But, but wire worms are going to be a major issue if you're going into sod ground. So especially this year in the midst of COVID, we might have had some people planting gardens that had not done that before, or you may be looking to do that in 2021. So just be aware of that sod ground is great as far as usually for fertility, but it can be detrimental with some of these insect species because you might not know that that's going to be an issue where it's a subterranean insect. But this is what they're going to look like. Oh, white grubs, and we're going to spend some time on these a little bit later. But you'll notice that that's going to be the larva of, whoops, I hit the wrong button, the May and June beetles. But notice here it's going to require about three years for those to mature, and they're going to lay their eggs in grassy areas. Now that's going to be critical because, again, we're going to have a specific window for twice a year that we can control these pests. Um, but another indicator, wildlife is often going to tell us that we might have a grub problem. So if, if you've ever had moles coming into the yard and leaving those big tunnels, or you've had some skunks come in and digging up, uh, that's probably because they're digging for grub worms. So that's going to indicate to you you've got an issue too. Cutworms, um, this is something that we can pretty much get a handle on if we're using some kind of physical barrier when we plant. Um, same thing with squash vine borer, which we'll talk about here in a minute, but um, basically you can see how that cutworm just cuts right off at the ground level. Um, if we take aluminum foil and put around um, that plant, when we plant it or even plant some of these plants in like little toilet um, roll holders, if we're planting by seed, uh, that can help deviate um, the cutworms from, from causing any damage. Another thing you can use are those little um, rings that come off your plastic milk jugs or gallon water jugs. You can also do that. Uh, thrips, um, of course, those are going to be one of those small insects that are going to be hard to see with the, with the naked eye. And they're going to produce a few generations a year, which is one of the reasons they're such a problem. But you can see those, um, you can see it on the stem of, of this tomato plant. Of course, this is just a blown up picture here to show you what some of that damage is going to look like. You're going to have some of that spittling on the leaf. I keep hitting that thing on my mouse, y'all. I'm sorry about that. I, I got a new mouse and it's kind of touchy. So, <laughs> um, But you can see some of that damage right here that brown stippling around the edge of that leaf and that's tomato spotted wilt feeding and we'll often see this in a greenhouse setting in early spring so if you're growing your own transplants be vigilant uh, about that in the springtime. Flea, beetle, flea beetles as the name uh, says they look like little fleas they'll actually hop around like a flea um, and they're going to leave this spittling damage so that's one indicator they love eggplant and they love radishes so I always tell folks to plant um, radishes throughout the, the season. Just keep them planted, even if you're not eating them. You can grow them in the understory of your garden, and flea beetles will usually go feed on radishes and leave um, eggplant alone. So you can, you can do something that way to, to save your egg, eggplant crop. Um, aphids are going to be very similar to, to thrips. You can see all the different colors here. I put that in there specifically, different, um, you can see the different stages, the different nymphs. And this is actually a ladybug larva there that is eating on aphids. So um, if you've probably heard that, that the ladybug beetle is a beneficial because she's eating those aphids. Uh, Lagus bugs, uh, these are sometimes called the kissing bug. They're going to have that little heart shape on their backs. You can see what the life stages look like right there. So I'm going to deviate just a little bit. Uh, the Mexican bean beetle, probably everybody knows what these look like because usually when we know we have a problem is when we see it at this stage. Uh, but they, they have a huge appetite. So when they get to this point, of course, they're reducing our um, leaf surface area and that's making chlorophyll, you know, less to be produced by photosynthesis, which is why we end up with a bunch of skeletonized leaves. So most of the time when we see skeletonization like that in the garden or landscape, uh, most often we're going to know that a beetle is going to be to blame for that. Up here you can just see the different stages of what that's going to look like, those bright yellow 
eggs and those are going to be on the underside of the leaves y'all so when you you know when you plant beans uh, get them trellised or if you have the bush beans make sure you're investigating those looking at the underside and uh, getting some control measures on that pretty quick stink bugs we're going to have a lot of different um, species of these this one has become the new ladybug as far as in houses you know everybody used to call in complaining about ladybugs and box elder beetles being in their houses and having to vacuum them up in soapy water well now it's the armor black marmorated stink bug and um, not only do they cause a nuisance in our houses but also when they're feeding on tomatoes because they have this long little piercer um, on their that's their mouth part and so you can see the little stipples there that they pierce that tomato with and then of course that's going to open that plant up to disease so this is going to be a hard one to control because he does have that armor uh, so any kind of ins insecticide whether it be organic or conventional is just going to be tough to control these critters um, white flies uh, much similar again to the um, thrips and the aphids but they look like miniature white flies this is something you're probably always going to have on tomato plants i don't know why this this thing is advancing on its own y'all it's not just me i'm not sure what it's doing but anyway um this is something that you're going to have to get control of pretty um, early on in the season or they're just going to have so many life cycles you'll never get it harnessed uh, the key here is when and we're going to talk about this in a couple of weeks when we talk about soil testing and proper soil fertility because we we want to make sure we're adhering to recommended guidelines as far as NP and K. If we push too much nitrogen early in the season, then that's going to promote that lush growth, and that's also going to be an incubator for white flies and thrips and aphids. They love that fresh, succulent, new growth, and that's what that um, nitrogen is going to provide. T tobacco and tomato hornworms. If you're curious in the difference there, I put those pictures in. Um, that this is what we typically see in East Tennessee, even feeding on our tomatoes. They got that little red horn, and then they've got the striped um, lines on their side. Uh, the squash vine board. This is one probably several of you have suffered through this summer as well, and you can see what damage this little critter here does. Um, you go out and pretty much this rotten area all along the, the at the ground level of the stem and it almost feels hollow and it's just bent over. Uh, sometimes you'll be fortunate enough you can just dig him right out of there and you can actually seal that even with aluminum foil or something to get you by but you got to get him removed for that to take effect. Um, the key here is getting down there when you first plant scouting for these eggs. Now this is where those toilet roll holders are going to come back into play. If you're planting by seed especially, just bury that toilet roll holder in the ground and plant your seed and that's going to prevent this critter from laying her eggs right at the soil line. And you can see again those are blowed up what that's going to look like. Uh, to go along with squash vine borer is the squash bug and it just looks mean and it causes a lot of causes a lot of issue. You can see a, a pumpkin in late season. You can actually see the nymphs feeding. Um, oftentimes internally there's not going to be a lot of damage. It's going to be um, just on external, but if you're, you know, growing pumpkins for decoration, then obviously that's going to be, uh, it's not going to be too pretty. And you can see here on summer squash, they're not going to be picky. Uh, they're going to feed on anything that has a vine, anything in the, in the cucurbit family. And oftentimes you're going to see the different uh, life cycles on one plant all feeding together because they do go through multiple life cycles. Their eggs are going to be a little bit different, but the key here is just to know when you see egg casings like that, um, that's usually not a good sign and we've got a problem and, and we need to try to get some control. Blister beetles, you'll hear me speak to these as being um, beneficial as well, and they can, they can be, um, but sometimes they can feed too much if you get an overpopulation, so we also put those in the troublesome um, category as well. And we're going to have different colors there as well. We can have striped. They're not all going to be black. Harlequin bugs, um, these are pesky little critters too. 
They're going to come in a wide range of colors. They look very similar to a stink bug because they are going to be related. You can see what those egg casings are going to look like right there. Pretty cool looking, but they're going to feed and travel in these armies is what I call them. And uh, they can pretty much decimate an, an entire crop. And they're not often too picky um, either. Colorado potato beetle, this is one we've probably all dealt with in the past. Uh, and he's pretty, pretty mean, but hopefully we've gotten uh, to the point now, we've gotten some season long control measures, but you can see here in the background, um, <laughs> there's nothing much left there. And again, if we don't have any foliage, then we don't have no way of making food. Uh, you can see the larva stage there, and of course, then the egg casings as well. I'm gonna have to get a different mouse next week, y'all. I have no idea what this is doing. It's very frustrating, so I apologize again. Um, let's see here. The corn air worm or the tomato fruit worm, we'll use those interchangeably. Uh, you'll see these moths flying around about this time of year. Uh, this is the one that gets in the ear of corn and then eats its way through our tomato fruit. Cucumber beetles, we have spotted and striped. And you can see the damage there. Uh, if we see that kind of damage on a cucumber, then that's more often than not going to be a um, cucumber beetle. And it basically looks like overnight you went out and you've poured scalded water on your cucumber plants. And you can see here it's bacterial because you can drop a, a piece of that cucumber in water and it'll have these striations. That's one way we, we know that that's a bacterial infection. Oh. And striped is the same. Um, I just put on, wait a minute, let's see, I'm telling y'all, my keyboard's not working, my mouse is being overzealous. Okay, uh, you can see what the striped there looks like, but oftentimes you'll see the striped and spotted feeding together, and we're going to treat them the same, same kind of injury. Cabbage looper, uh, diamondback moth, and the imported cabbage looper are on the next few slides, and we're going to treat all of those. Pretty much the same. We call them a looper because like the inchworm, they loop along. Um, we're going to see those moths flying around in early springtime or even this time of year. This is the diamondback moth. You can see what he looks like in full blown there, but this is the damage that they can cause. So that's why investing in a good BT product will be uh, really good for you because it'll help um, dispel those. You can see him there how tiny he is and especially within cabbage heads or broccoli they'll get down into the crowns or into the head and you don't often see them because they're covered up by those other leaves so sometimes it can be too late to even try to control those. But this is the one that's really prevalent this time of, uh, in the early spring that we see here in East Tennessee. And we get excited because we see the white butterfly, but this is the damage that they cause. So oftentimes in the early spring, we'll need to cover with um, some kind of remay, uh, breathable fabric, and that's going to prevent her from laying eggs in here, which turn into this and feeding on your plants. So keep that in mind. Uh, spider mites, you're going to have that stippling there as well. It's going to look very similar to tomato spotted wilt virus. Look on the underside of that leaf and you can just see them covered up there. And they'll actually have that little spider or the web casing there as well. And you'll actually be able to see the little mites. Okay, so now we're going to kind of look at specific insects along with their specific uh, mouth part to kind of tie some of this together if I can get my mouse to cooperate. Um, again, we've already talked a lot about chewing damage, and you can see, again, some of these, what kind of damage that they're, they're causing. And again, that Japanese beetle pretty much just skeleton, skeletonizing uh, the leaf. Okay, so here's one um, that we're starting to see evidence of right now. I put this in here in, in a few slides just to, again, point out how important it is to know what the pest is and when the best time to control it is. So when we see the bagworm this time of year, we have pretty much lost our window of opportunity. Um, this is one that's gonna feed on a, about 128 different species in our landscapes. That bag is actually gonna be made of silk and twigs and leaves from that host plant. So that's why um, they're so devastating to the, to the plant. 
And you can see what that's going to look like as they move up those plants. And even on that little spruce there, we get that dead foliage. There's not really going to be a way to salvage that plant once it gets to that stage. So you can see there in the early beginnings. Now this is what it's going to look like in the springtime. It looks a lot different than it does this time of year, right? And then we see just a lot of these on the same plant. They're just going to continue to get bigger until they reach this stage. And the reason this time of year it's not a good time to control is because whether, again, we're spraying organic or conventional insecticides, it's going to be hard to penetrate that, that bag, right? So we want to uh, um, be able to spray our insecticide when they're at this stage, which is in the early spring. They emerge from this cocoon in about early to mid-May, maybe late May, depending on where we're at. But when they're starting to crawl is when they're going to start building those, those bags, and that's when we need to get control. Interesting little, little creature there. So it won't be too much longer because they're actively feeding right now. And again, just some different pictures there. Um, another insect that we get a lot of questions about this time of year are the different caterpillars. And we don't make a, you know, a, a huge emphasis on being able to identify it right down to the nitty gritty. We'll usually just refer to those as forest tent caterpillars. So let's go back into the spring. Uh, we have the eastern tent caterpillars. Uh, you'll notice there that their hosts are going to be primarily fruit trees whereas the forest tin are going to be primarily what our cove hardwood trees are going to be. And you can see there by looking at both, not a lot of difference there in those uh, species. Um, but these are the ones that crawl when you're out mowing in the yard in early spring. It almost looks like you're moving, like you're in water when they're crawling. And you can see there what that um, tent casing first starts out looking like. Almost looks like... Um, what we would can uh, like a praying mantis cocoon. The color is a little different. So a lot of us would look at that and think, oh, that's that's a beneficial bug. When in reality, that's what that's it, just it beginning to start its tent. And you can see how, the difference there. This one's going to be a little bit more um, from twig to twig, whereas this is going to be more on the foliage of the tree. Uh, we'll also get those confused with the fall webworms that we see starting from now on into September, October. Uh, tussock moths are going to fall into this. So again, if you have woodland area on your property or if, if you like to get outdoors, um, if you're first on the trail, you're going to be the one walking in between uh, the trees where those tussock moths have spent their um, webs because these are going to be all throughout um, the forest. And sometimes they're easy to see because of this white color, but Sometimes they blend in. Canker worms, uh, they blend in pretty good. You can see how he's blending in with that twig. Um, some are going to look a little bit similar to um, tomato worms. And of course, the female is going to be in the moth form. This is defoliation of a canker worm on a hackberry tree. So again, it was kind of like that oak tree I showed you earlier with bacterial scorch. Uh, when we see a tree, you know, in May that looks like this, then we know we need to in investigate that a little bit further, which when we get to this point, oftentimes uh, a tree may be too far gone for us to do anything. Uh, walnut caterpillars, these are going to be active right up until September. They're going to feed on primarily nut trees. We have a lot of folks that will think that these are poisonous. A pack saddle, some of you may have heard of that, um, but these are actually the, the walnut caterpillars and sometimes often confused with yellow neck. Uh, they typically don't tend to be a major problem unless we have a huge population of them. Same thing with the orange striped oak worm. We're going to treat all of these the same. I'm just trying to share some of these with you though, so if you see some of these um, injuries on some of your landscape or in your woodland areas, uh, you'll know what that is. Uh, now the gypsy moth would be a little bit different. This is one that's on our USDA list of um, not parasitic plants, but it's one of the it's one of the bad bugs. You can actually, let's see here, 
yeah. You can actually see um, it being sprayed, the forest being sprayed, uh, the Cherokee and the Pisgah National Forest right here on the, on the border, uh, spray for the gypsy moth. This is what it looks like. He's a furry thing with little red dots. That's one way to differentiate. Plus the moth is a little bit different. He's got that two pair of wings and the red undercoat. So if you see one of these, that's not good. Uh, they can decimate an entire woodland crop um, pretty much overnight, voracious appetites. Um, I'm hoping I'm throwing some different species at y'all tonight that you might not be as familiar with, but that we're starting to see a little bit more on the rise as far as, um, you know, receiving pictures of some of these issues, um, even in our in-service training, some of these things are starting to go up in numbers. So we're starting to see an increase in some of these pests. Uh, sawflies are going to be almost slug-like in their appearance. You can kind of see how they got that fatter head and sluggy-like body, um, but they're a non-stinging wasp. And you can see what that cocoon looks like. And again, many folks will think that that's a good cocoon, but when we see those hanging on our uh, trees, um, that's probably something we need to get control of pretty quick because you can see some of the damage that they're causing right here. Uh, that's been feeding just over um, a year's time. And they can completely decimate uh, an entire population. The rose sawfly, especially here in East Tennessee, and that the rose slug, we're starting to see an increase in these. So if you're growing roses of any kind, uh, be on the lookout for that. And then of course the scarab beetles, again, we're going back to the grub worms. Any of those beetles are gonna be in that grub form. You can see here um, where they're gonna feed on the roots of that, any of those plants, especially you know, within a foot um, of the soil line, many different species. And different grub worms, and I'm not that good y'all, but you know, different beetles are gonna look like different grub worms, but uh, for all intents and purposes, we're gonna treat them the same. But you can see there one that's actively feeding. Now, here's the, here's the biggie. You know, we will often recommend applying um, grub X or some kind of grub worm control in the spring when the forsythia is starting to bloom. Uh, because we know that they're starting to rise to the top and they're gonna start actively feeding, which is what they're gonna do all summer long. But then as the weather starts getting cooler, they're gonna start burrowing down deep again. So if we're applying any kind of chemical throughout the summer months, when we may see more of these, whether it be because of wildlife or we're planting in our gardens and our flower beds and we, you know, we're digging around and we just see more of these, this is not the time to be trying to control grub worms. We want to hit the window, you know, here or here in the fall. So we're getting ready to come up, you know, mid-September to the first October when we're going to make that application um, to get them while they're actively feeding before they burrow deep. And again, y'all are very familiar with the Japanese beetle injury. You probably want me to skip over that. Uh, willow leaf beetles, some of these are kind of cool looking. These are just true bugs um, that are all going to be treated the same when we go to control. But if you see any of these type bugs, I show you a bunch of pictures of these just so you can refer back to the, the difference between the beneficials and the troublesome. These are ones we don't want to be um, to gaining populations of. One I didn't put on here was the kudzu bug. That's one that started to grow um, in population in the last couple months. I mean, a couple of years. All right, then we have insect and mite pests with sucking mouth parts. And this is where um, a lot of the true bugs are gonna come into play. And you can see what some of that damage, especially from our scale insects, what some of that's gonna look like. Um, again, you can see that almost looks like a uh, herbicide injury. And this here, I mean, it, it can look like many different things. That's why we ask a lot of questions and try to get to the bottom of it to determine what pests that we're dealing with. I do know, again, that anything in your flowers, your gardens, landscape, um, there's going to be an aphid pest that's going to be troublesome for you. Uh, sooty mold probably being the most popular. We get a lot of calls on this every year. Um, that's that black fungus. You can actually see it on the trees itself. You can see it on benches and picnic tables, outside chairs, anything you've got under a tree that might have that. Um, it's not pathogenic, but it is going to um, get its nourishment from insect honeydew. 
So when we see that black soot on our trees, then we know that we have an infestation of some kind of, in, of insect, usually aphid. That uh, honeydew, you can see how that sap kind of looks like it's dripping off that leaf right there. And basically what that is, is evidence to us that there's a sap sucking insect there. Um, there are flow and feeders, which remember flow and flows up, or xylem flows up, flow and flows down, cambium layer goes round and round. So that flow and la um, layer is actually that sap layer. That's all they want. So what they do as a result is they are, are leaving behind this, this honeydew, and that's a carbohydrate, that's a food source. So what can happen then is that you got all these spores flying around in the air, and you're going to get sporulation because they're using sugar as food, and um, that's going to disrupt photosynthesis. Um, another way to be able to tell if we've got a sap sucker, you notice anything here? That sidewalk is wet under that tree, but it's not rained anywhere else. That can often be an indicator that we've got a sap sucker that we need to, to investigate a little bit closer. Oftentimes we won't even much pay attention to the leaves until we get an issue like this. But um, again, it's, it's not pathogenic, but it can lead to some secondary issues that are hard to control. Ants, if you have a huge uh, increase in ant population where you're not supposed to, you know, like uh, peonies or pinies or peonies, however you pronounce them in your part of the world, uh, you need ants for pollin pollination of those. So that's going to be normal to see that in some of our other herbs and things. But if you have a, a large increase in ant population, you might want to investigate because you could have some aphid, aphids feeding somewhere and leaving behind that honeydew excrement. Um, hackberry aphid, this one is a little bit different because he looks like a cotton ball or the end of a Q-tip almost, so um, pretty easy for us to identify, more so than some other species. But again, this is the damage that they're leaving behind. That's that sooty mold just from that honeydew. It's hard to imagine something this tiny that looks like that can cause that kind of damage. And that's just a blowed up version of what he looks like. Uh, lace, lace bugs are going to feed on the underside of leaves. So if you have yonimus or boxwood, any kind of landscape plant like that, that has like a waxy cuticle, um, even holly trees, sometimes they will suffer from lace bugs. So they'll feed on the underside so you won't see them, but this is that stippling effect that you're going to get. And oftentimes we'll think that's a physiological um, response, um, but in actuality we got to dig a little deeper and, and find out that it's a, it's a lace bug. Four-line plant bug, if you grow mints, whether you're growing in pots or containers, raised beds, whatever, uh, you, you probably know this pest. Um, if you don't grow a lot of mint or are looking to do that, beware, because this is one that will feast on your, um, on your mints especially. Uh, tarnished tarnish plant bug, again, it's going to be related to the stink bug. Those harlequin bugs are all going to be related, but you'll notice there that they're going to cause that terminal growth to become yellow and distorted. So when that happens again, we get that twisting in the top of the plant. It can cause bud deformity or cause us to not even um, have any fruit produced at all. And then if it's on a landscape plant, flower buds will not even, um, they won't even bloom. But that whole bud aborts. Scale insects, uh, this is going to be one of the most destructive groups of insects uh, that attack ornamental. You're not going to see this very much in the garden, but if you have a landscape you're, you're proud of, you're going to see um, one or both of these, armored scale or soft scale. And again, this is how they're going to feed. They basically latch onto that twig and then they're going to lay eggs as they move along. The difference, um, armored scale has that shell. They almost look like oyster shells. Whereas the soft scale doesn't have that, um, that coating. So you, um, yeah, with the armored scale, you don't have honeydew pro uh, production or no sooty mold. The yonimus scale, this is one that's pretty easy to identify because it's gonna be white feeding on the underside of those leaves. Um, but this is one that we do refer to as an armored scale. Those eggs are going to be super tiny, they're going to be yellow, um, oval, and they're only going to be found beneath that armor of the mother 
um, insect. And there's a pretty heavy infestation. And you'll notice that it's also on the twigs and the branches as well as the leaves, so it's not going to discern between any, any part of that plant. Okay, and then um, you're also going to see this on Pachysandra, if anybody grows that as a ground cover, and again, camellias. Um, we've even seen it on rhododendron and azaleas. Sometimes those will be grown with um, pieris, um, privet, all of those. None of those are going to be immune to this. And you'll notice there that they overwinter as um, fully grown fertilized females. Fertilized being the key word. So that means in the spring they're going to emerge and they can have up to three generations. That's why it's such a troublesome insect. Uh, soft scale, they're going to be a little bit more noticeable. They're going to have that little bit more conspic uh, conspicuous profile. Uh, these are going to emerge as a crawler, kind of like the bagworm. So we're going to be able to see those a little bit better in the springtime. That makes me want to itch when I see that picture. You can see how tiny they are. Now the armored scale does not produce honeydew, so we don't have sooty mold. The soft scale does. So we are going to have um, some honeydew production. This one is going to be a tad bit easier to control though than the armored. And again, just notice you're going to have a lot of different insects that are going to be attracted uh, to that honeydew. And you can see the scale insects along that branch there. Check out this picture though. That's going to be really hard to get control of there, right? And then you can see just a, it doesn't look like there's anything major going on there, but then this is actually obscure uh, scale. It's going to be really hard to see. And again, it kind of looks like oyster shells, I guess. Um, but this is the damage it can cause just after a year of these being along the trunk and along the stems and branches. Um, and, and you'll notice all these scales have different names, but it doesn't mean that tulip tree scale is just going to affect tulip tree. You'll notice there it's also going to affect magnolia and linden. Uh, there are going to be uh, some differences to trained entomologists, but for our purposes, we're going to we're going to try to control these all the same. And we're just going to look at that and be like that scale. That's a soft scale, and this is what we need to do to control it. But again, you'll you'll have these as reference for you in, in one place if you see these in your landscape. But uh, the bad thing with these scale insects, that, again, is that enormous amount of eggs that they're going to produce. But notice here, um, one of the things that's unique to some of these scale is that they're going to, uh, the crawlers are going to emerge this time of year versus a lot of us thinking about crawlers emerging in the springtime. So, you know, now's going to be the time to be controlling some of these scale insects. Mealy bugs, uh, those look like a white moving scale insect. Again, they're going to really like that succulent growth on any plant, so be really careful with your nitrogen fertility. A little dab more is not better. Um, we've talked about that in our disease classes. We'll talk more about that in soil class, but even for insects, it's not good if we increase uh, nitrogen fertility because that is going to draw specific populations of insects in. Um, hibiscus, if anybody grows hibiscus, this is one that uh, mealybugs love hibiscus. You can kind of see there how he's latched on, they have. Okay, so moving on to mites, and again, we're going to treat these a little bit differently than insects as far as control measures. So that's why when we're out identifying, whether it be in our garden or our, or our landscape, we need to be able to discern if it's an insect or a, or a mite, if we're, gonna, if we're gonna use any kind of insecticide to control that, organic or conventional. I can't say that enough. Uh, and again, there's lots of different species. We're not gonna get too bogged down in the types, but I put these in here for your reference. So you'll be able to distinguish those in the garden or landscape. And again, when we, when we think about spider mites, those immature stages are going to resemble the adults, just going to be difference in size. So same thing with um, ticks. You know, they start out little tiny and they get bigger, but they look, they look the same. Um, populations of these are going to increase pretty rapidly because it's only going to take about a week for them to, to produce. That's why we have such a, an issue with those in the garden and landscape. 
I'm kind of hitting myself there, didn't I? All right, so let's look at some damage from some of these. And again, we, you know, I've, I've put the specific insect. This is a spruce mite. I would probably look at that and just say that's a, that's mite damage because I'm going to treat them all the same. But um, you can tell there you've got some bronzing along the outer side, and typically it's going to show up from the outside in and from the bottom up. You can see what that fading of foliage is going to look like. Some of these mites can be pretty detrimental to some of our like Leyland cypress and arborvitae species and really it's going to be hard to control some of those but but that's why again it's going to be really critical to determine what we're dealing with. Um, this is our two spotted spider mites and again that stippling is going to be pretty characteristic of spider mite damage even if we don't see the the crawlers. Often we'll see that webbing And again, you can see that stippling of color there on the on the needles. See what the egg casings there look like. Uh, of course, the southern red mite. This is probably uh, our number one mite species in East Tennessee. Uh, a lot of folks will refer to them as the noceums. Uh, they're going to be active you know, probably within another month, like they are in the springtime. In the summer, uh, you don't feel them crawling all over you like you do in the spring and in the fall. Uh, they're going to overwinter in that egg stage. And we're going to talk about cleaning up the garden and everything in a couple of weeks. And we're going to speak to how to get rid of some of these type insects and disease pathogens in a couple of weeks. And again, I don't want to spend too much time on some of that. I just want you to have pictures to be able to, to refer back to. Um, internal feeding damage, we're often going to get that confused with um, disease, some kind of fungal organism, or sometimes a physiological issue. This, you know, from, from first glance is going to look like some kind of pathogen to me. I'm going to think of a mildew or a, or a fungal, fungal disease of some, some sort. Even looking at it, you know, just glancing at it, that's what I'm going to think about. But this is what's going on internally within that leaf. That's why we have to dig a little deeper and pay a little bit closer attention. But those insects can eventually lead to, to this internal feeding damage, which looks really cool. Um, if anybody has celandine poppies, this can be a really bad one on celandines, wood poppies. Um, again, this is the leaf gall. I showed you a picture of that a little bit earlier. Um, these are actually insects. That's not a, a, a pathogen of any kind. Uh, sometimes if we get a heavy mass of that, those, of course, it is going to disrupt photosynthesis. Um, but this is something if, you know, if, if this keeps spreading, then it is going to cause a, a pretty unique problem. And this is just blowed up to show you what that insect looks like inside that gall. And galls are going to be different sizes, different species are going to look a little bit differently. Some of you may have seen these galls. Some people might think that's a walnut or some kind of nut crop. When in actuality, that's, a, that's an insect laid by a gall wasp. Uh, same thing here. Walking along in the woods, sometimes you may see some of these weird um, creations on the tree limbs and things. That's what the inside, a dissection of that's going to look like. Lots of little insects. I'm not sure where, who took this picture. I think Dr. Frank Hale did. Um, so maybe somewhere in Nashville. But if nothing else, it's worth just keeping that to see. I don't know. That's just pretty cool. <laughs> uh, again, leaf miners. We've talked a lot about these. If you see this kind of damage, it's a leaf miner 100%. Boxwoods are going to be really prevalent to some of these. Uh, and again, um, controlling it at that larval stage is going to be ideal. Of course, when we think about some of those plants I just mentioned, they've got that waxy cuticle. So, you know, so we're going to have to maybe take an extra step when it comes to control mechanisms. Um, Bores, again, just looking for some damage on the tree. You can see that injury there. We've got bark that's coming off. Uh, not only is that going to provide an entryway for um, insects, but also for disease as well. These metallic wood boring beetles, um, flathead beetles, this is the kind of damage that they're going to 
calls. They can actually girdle and, and kill a, a tree. Um, anytime we have a D-shaped hole in a tree, tree bark, stem, twig, uh, that's an exit hole for these flathead borers because you can see what that head looks like. It's that D shape, so that's how we know that's a flathead. But you can see some of the damage they've caused here, and that's going to be really hard for those trees um, to bounce back from. The uh, um, Asian longhorn beetle, that's another one of those imported pests uh, that's caused a lot of uh, trouble in our forest lands. And then you can, I'll let you refer to that later. If you ever see anything that looks like toothpicks coming out of tree bark, then that's a uh, ambrosia beetle. And we're starting to see a higher occurrence of this. ETSU um, has quite a few species with this um, each year on campus. So, and you'll notice though, they're attracted to healthy and unhealthy trees. It's not just a, a sick tree. And again, you can see some of that damage and an entry point. And then you can see some of those exit points. So they're a cool looking um, beetle, but they can wreak a lot of havoc. And again, I'm, I'm going through these pretty fast because I'm not sure where I'm at on time, but yeah, I don't want to keep y'all on here all night because I've got some other things I want to share with you. And we've talked about galls. There's some just more pictures of those. Yeah, and we've talked about some of those exotic pests. If you ever see this pest, and you're likely to see it in a woodpile, um, that is one of those that needs to be um, reported because you'll notice there it's never been found in Tennessee. But we do have some native beetle species that's going to look alike. So again, just have those for um, for reference. The emerald ash borer that's uh, growing um, in populations, it's got that metallic look to it. Um, it's it has been found in Tennessee since this was printed and you can see what that damage is going to cause there. Hemlock woolly adelgid, this is one of those that got, uh, uh, this was, I don't know, probably 20 years ago that hemlock woolly adelgid. So if you see this cottony substance on the underside of your hemlock trees, that's probably going to be the adelgid. Uh, we've figured out how to better control these now on hemlocks. It, uh, it can be a little bit pricey, but uh, digging a trench around the tree and, and moving uh, a metacloprid usually is the insect insecticide of choice there. All right, I think I've talked a lot about some of these already. Yeah, this. Okay. Now we're going to move into control issues. Okay, so basically what we've gone through so far are just looking at some of the um, the signs and symptoms that insect damage is going to leave behind. You know, it's kind of us, up to us to go behind, you know, behind them, scouting, making sure we know exactly what type of insect we're dealing with, what life cycle it is, is in, you know, and then start researching which ways are going to be best uh, to control those pests. So, uh, the biggest tip I can give you is that just anticipate insect and disease problems because we know they're going to be an issue every year. For those of you that have taken my classes before, you hear me talk about journaling all this, and that might sound silly, but keep a garden journal, even if it's something as simple as writing down, you know, the date you first see Japanese beetles, and then the date you don't see Japanese beetles. That gives you kind of a window to work with. That's going to help you better plan for years after, especially like for companion planting. Um, you know, building that biodiverse ecosystem that I always refer to in our uh, gardens and landscapes. That's going to help us be able to know what pests we had this year, because if we had it this year, we're going to have it next year. And eventually we can just put this jigsaw puzzle together and get something that, that works for all of us. Um, removing vegetation and debris that's going to harbor any type of disease. And again, we're going to spend time talking about that in a few weeks. Uh, we want to be uh, turning under any spent plants in the garden or removing those. If they're not diseased, put them on the compost pile. If they are, burn them. Get rid of those pathogens. We want to be inspecting those uh, plants pretty regularly. You saw a lot of these species. Some of them we're not going to know we've got a major problem until it might be too late. And applying whatever control that we're using when it's in the, in the young, most vulnerable stage of that pest life cycle. 
um, use only plant varieties that are going to be suited to your area. That's going to be um, a big deal because some of these hybrids are created specifically for an insect or disease. Um, again, using that correct amount of fertilizer, lime, and water. Uh, you've heard me preach on the watering before. Don't be watering every single day um, because, you know, promoting shallow rooting and things like that. Lack of water or too much water can actually help increase the fertility of plants at different times of year, which is going to increase certain insect species. Uh, when we think about insects overwintering, it's actually quite low. Uh, the reason for that is their reproductive capacity because the large populations of most of these insects are developing like right now and they're you know finishing that right now. Uh, when we do go to plant in our garden, the quicker and the earlier we can get our crops out at, as early as that weather permits as far as soil temp for seed germination, um, frost dates, um, all that, the earlier we can get our garden planted then that's going to really help us reduce some of these heavy infestations of of some of these insects. Um, one thing about um, cold crops in East Tennessee, you know, a lot of folks want to put out their spring cold crops, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, all of that in February and March, but often we'll have more insect pressure here than if we plant a fall crop of that. So if anybody is wanting to think about planting fall crop, cold crops, our insect pressure is not quite as high. Um, don't plant your vegetable garden in ground that was in sod. We talked about that with the wire worms. Um, if we're doing cover crops, we want to be plowing and turning that in at least three weeks before planting. And again, this is something we're going to speak a lot more in detail in a, in a couple of weeks. So hopefully by the end of August, you'll be able to put all this together and be working toward a plan to reduce disease and insect uh, populations for next year. Um, but the other thing if we're um, plowing early, then that's going to eliminate some of those weed species that are going to support insects. It's going to expose some, whoops, where my thing, uh, expose many pests to drying, cold weather, and even predators. And then we need to be rotating crops. And I'm not going to speak a lot about crop rotation because we're going to do that in a couple of weeks. But just recognize that a lot of these cultural um, methods of control are going to be ideal. You know, if, if we're you know, mo and most everybody that takes these classes uh, trend more on the natural and organic side. And, and that's fine. Those of you that know me know that that's the first route that I go to, but sometimes I have to come in and, and hit pretty heavy with the fungicide or with an insecticide, depending on what I've, I've got. Um, cucumber beetles, for instance, horrible statewide um, this year. So um, I made a couple applications of a of Malathion and I still didn't get control of the of the cucumber beetles. They were just uh, pretty tough this year. But recognizing that if we employ all of these tactics into our gardens and landscapes, um, that's really going to help us reduce our population significantly. So it's all going to go back to site selection and, and crop rotation, uh, time of planting, companion plants. We talked about that uh, back in the springtime too. So um, if, you're, if you've not seen those, make sure you watch Companion Plants and the Beneficials because all of these are going to tie together with tonight's class. Um, controlling weeds that are going to harbor some of those species, um, making sure that we're growing varieties that are going to be resistant to some of these, and then harvesting timely. We don't want insects to come out there and feast um, because, because we're not there. Uh, companion Plants, just as a little refresher there. Um, rosemary's often been said to help repel bean beetles. Of course, basil uh, makes your tomatoes taste sweeter and it also helps repel the hornworms. Um, eggplant and catnip, of course, catnip's a mint, so can, you can use radishes here, but um, catnip does help repel the flea beetles. And then thyme will help repel cabbage worms. So things like that. Um, if you start incorporating some of those and start building on it every year, then you can start reducing some of those populations. As far as uh, some mechanical issues, uh, sun solarization, and I think that is in your weed folder, folder 14 in the Google Drive. Um, there's a method in there for doing the soil solarization. Um, so a lot of people are using that to, to reduce populations. Physical barriers like aluminum foil and small cans. Um, some folks will use reflective mulch 
they've said that yellow repels aphids and sil uh, silver repels thrips. That's what you're looking at here is a, a research plot. Um, cutting out vine borders, that's actually one of those things we refer to as a, a mechanical issue. You're not going to have to spray an insecticide, but you're going to be uh, cutting those out and handpicking hornworms. And then sweeping, just taking a broom and sweeping off your plants. I had to put a picture of the hickory horn devil in here somewhere, and I didn't know where to put him, but uh, he, uh, he's kind of a cool looking creature. He does like trees, just FYI, so if you have hickories, beware. Um, you, you won't see him in a vegetable garden, but you, you, know, you don't want to run into him in a dark alley either. But when we get to talking about um, insect control as far as chemicals, you'll see there's lots of different ways that we can do that. On the seed, in the soil, on the foliage, or on the fruit. And then we've got a lot of common insecticides. We're going to go through those real quick. Uh, let me just speak to on the seed, what that would mean. Um, sometimes we get seed that's already been pre-treated, so that would fall in that category. Or if you're treating your potato buds at planting in the furrow, um, that would be considered a, a placement of chemical on seed. So let's talk about a few of these. And these are going to be in your Google Drive. And I've got an entire list there, so you'll be able to, to tell the difference and have that in a quick chart to refer to. Uh, seven is actually the trade name of carbaryl. That's a carbamate insecticide. You'll notice here I put it's relatively safe. Um, so don't shoot me for people that are organic, but for those that are using insecticides, as far as insecticides goes, um, residues and, and things like that, it's going to be relatively safe. Uh, it's going to be pretty broad spectrum. It's going to control many kinds of insects. It is the most popular garden insect insecticide use, but this is the one that mites populations can build up if you're using this. And it's also going to be toxic to honeybees, so if you're spraying this, and you can, but uh, be cautious when your plants are in bloom, when bees are feeding, and then you want to apply it late in the day when the bee activity is lessened. Um, if you are using seven, and this is real critical, so if you don't listen to a lot I say, make sure you hear this. You know, when we talk about rotation, we talk about that, you know, crop rotation, but we also want to rotate chemicals. And you've heard me speak to that in disease class and in the weeds class. Uh, but you want to do that with insecticides too, because that Colorado potato beetle, we weren't rotating um, chemistry, we weren't rotating the mode of um, action. And that's why we get resistance built up. So if you're using seven, uh, you may want to investigate a couple of other insecticides to rotate that out. So use seven a couple times, then use a, an organic or use malathion. Don't use this over and over and over again. Uh, malathion, as far as the stair step goes, uh, this is a, an organophosphate. It's also going to be frequently used in the garden. An organophosphate. Um, I put on here, it's relatively safe to apply uh, because the residues disappear quickly. Um, it is going to control, again, broad spectrum, many pests. So this is one you're going to want to alternate with seven if you're using um, a chemical insecticide. Uh, you can get that available in a dust or a wettable power, uh, powder or even a, an emulsifiable concentrate. Just be careful with that because um, those have to be continually um, agitated, stirred up. Um, pyrethrums, um, I should have actually put that um, this is pyrethrin. There's pyrethroid, pyrethrin, pyrethrin, and I tend to use those all interchangeably, but there's a little bit of difference there. Uh, pyrethrum is made from chrysanthemum, so it is derived from an organic compound. It's a contact botanical insecticide. It's not a stomach poison like a lot of folks think. Um, if you want a rapid knockdown, it's going to give you that, but it's not going to be long lasting. So be aware of that. That's something you're going to have to be uh, making more application of. Um, and just know that when we talk about pyrethrums or pyrethrin, uh, the pyrethroids are a man made version of per permethrin. That's the other one. Uh, it's, it's man made, whereas the pyrethrum is going to be um, the true organic. So man-made chemistry versus natural chemistry. Uh, spinosad, this is also on the organic list. 
I'm not going to try to pronounce those for you, but spinosis is going to be a lot like BT in that it's going to control any soft-bodied insect. Uh, those leaf miners we were talking about, if you see an issue, uh, spinosis is going to be your go-to for that. And again, it's or organic. Um, it's even going to give you a little bit of control on some of those bores that we saw. And notice here that it's not going to impact our predatory um, wasp and beneficial mites and spiders. So that's, a, that's another plus for that. BT, uh, most of you are probably familiar with that. Dipel and thuricide are going to be trade names that we often see uh, for that. Thuricide is going to be often used in a lawn situation. Well, so is dipel. Uh, dipel is going to be those granules that folks will scatter in their landscape, maybe to repel slugs. Um, it's going to be extremely effective against any kind of caterpillar. It basically um, chews up their insides kind of softens it together. So it's not going to be instant like the spinosad. As far as knockdown, it's going to take a little while for that material to work in the insect, if that makes sense. So you're going to be looking about a week out before you get any control. Uh, just some other tips and reminders here about some of those plants that we talked about in companion plants. Um, I won't go into a lot of these. You can, you can refer back to those. Uh, some people will always ask me about burning in the garden. So I have seen some recommendations for putting matches, burnt matches in the hole when you plant peppers because that sulfur is supposed to produce or uh, help that pepper plant produce more. Um, I've never tried that, but I always burn. Um, just a brush pile in my garden every year and that's where I plant my peppers and I usually get really big peppers. So that's just a FYI from personal experience. Um, and you'll notice a lot of our whoops, wildflower species that we're seeing right now, that we're seeing blooming, those are actually going to be um, attractants for beneficial insects. And remember, those beneficial insects are what's going to eat those aphids and caterpillar eggs and spider mites. And that's the insects we want to be drawn in into the garden. And I think in essence of time, I'm not going to have time to go through the beneficials. But let me remind you again that um, let me stop sh sharing my screen here, or let me try sharing something else. Maybe. Hey, Glenn, what do you see on my screen? Do you see conventional and organic product? Hollywood Squares. Hollywood Squares. <laughs> it's only you, Melody, with your thing in the back. Oh. Okay. Well. Okay, never mind. I'm not going to try to do that. Hmm. Yeah, that's not gonna, okay. Maybe it's just been because I've been four weeks with not doing a, without doing a class that I've not I've, I've forgotten how to run Zoom. <laughs> okay, oh, so no. I know that was a lot of information to throw at y'all. And maybe some of you think, wow, that was just all haphazard, but it was really tough to try to figure out how to narrow the focus um, for tonight because, you know, we, we spent that hour back in the spring on the beneficials and we spent an hour on companions. So again, make sure you go back and refer to that because I feel like it's going to help bring tonight's class uh, maybe full circle. So again, tonight, I just really want you to be more aware when you're out in the garden or landscape, um, just paying attention to, again, some of those symptoms, the damage that we're going to, that we're going to see and just become um, a really good scout. Um, and, and then, you know, as far as identification, sending us pictures or bringing a sample in, letting us look at it. Um, and that, that can really go a long way in being able to get control of a lot of these. And then just make sure that you're um, keeping a record of all that, because what, what, what trouble you have now, you're going to have trouble from now on, I promise. So, but we can reduce that. It's just going to take a little work. So, don't don't think I'm a negative Nelly saying that. It just takes a little time to to get us there. So, um, I hope y'all will join us for the next four Melody, weeks. Yes. Melody, can you put in a plug for the um, Greenville res uh, residents for Ask Us? Oh yeah. Well, um, yeah, if you go to our website, which will be in the email, if you have garden questions, just click on the Ask Us tab and you can submit your garden question via online that way. And one of us will get back to you within a couple of days. Good point, thank you. Uh, but again, uh, watch your email, 
get access to that Google Drive. There's about eight documents in there. Um, I'll put the video in tomorrow. And um, again, join us for the next four weeks, if you will, because we're just going to kind of build on each one of these and get y'all off and growing really good in 2021.